The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. A couple of announcements. Uh, tomorrow we'll resume uh, testing. We'll have uh, Quiz 8 based on uh, the two versions of Homework 7, which one of which, uh, the second one, the beta version, I've relabeled Homework 8, and uh, it's posted on the web as such. So, so that there's no confusion. There's a Homework 7, and there was a second Homework 7. One focused on X-ray diffraction, and the other one had X-ray diffraction and defects. So that's the subject matter for tomorrow's 10-minute uh, uh, test. And uh, I think that's all I have by way of introduction. Uh, anybody recognize the music? Philip Glass, yes. What else would you play if you're teaching amorphous solids? You could play something like Glass Onion by the Beatles if you can stand the Beatles, but didn't want to do that. So, oh yeah, there's people my generation, there's two categories, those that think the Beatles are great and those that think they're just, <clears throat> and I'm in it's the second category. They bore me. Anyways, uh, this is uh, what we were looking at. Okay, so what we want to do today is continue the treatment of, uh, of glasses. Uh, last day we saw that amorphous solids uh, were formed under certain conditions, and these were the three that we enunciated, that glass formation is enhanced, and here I'm talking about liquid to solid, liquid to solid. We can also form glasses by uh, vapor to solid, but I'm talking about the dominant form of glass formation. If we have a highly viscous liquid, that is trying to rearrange itself to find a rather complex crystal structure in the solid and the cooling rate is very, very rapid, those three factors together will make it difficult for the atoms to find their proper lattice sites. And as a result, some of the disorder of the liquid will be quenched in and the result will be a glass. And today I wanted to study a particular form of glass, which is the dominant one you know, silicate glasses. And these are based on silica, and uh, we're going to study their structure and their properties today. And so um, the first thing we want to recognize is that we're talking about something that's inorganic and covalent. It's covalent in both uh, silicon and oxygen we form sp3 hybrids, so we have the capability of forming four bonds. And obviously oxygen forms two, and then two of its pairs of electrons are in non-bonding orbitals. Silicon, on the other hand, has four electrons, each of which shares. And the difference between what you're seeing here and what you're seeing in something like diamond is that in diamond or in uh, a, a, a crystalline silicon, all of the atoms on the board would be the same. We'd have either all carbons sp3 hybridized or all silicons sp3 hybridized. Here we've got silicons and oxygens. So each silicon has four oxygens as nearest neighbors. And if the atoms align perfectly, we will end up with something that is crystalline. But uh, Tom, if we could go to the document camera, I'd like to show what the, uh, what the basics of glass formation are. Uh, consider the yellow atoms as being silicons and the gray atoms as being oxygen. So you see every silicon has four uh, oxygen atoms and every oxygen atom lies between two silicon atoms. And these are both sp3 hybridized, but there's a difference. The difference is that in the case of silicon, all four bonds are specified in space. But in the case of oxygen, this bond here, the bond that bridges the two silicons, it can maintain the 109 degree angle but rotate because the, the, other, the other two orbitals are, are simply containing non-bridging, uh, excuse me, um, non-bonding electrons. So because this is free to rotate, we have the possibility that in the liquid state it's twisting and turning every which way. And then as the temperature drops and the material's getting the signal, it's time to form the solid these have to twist around. They have to align themselves perfectly. If they do so, we'll end up with something that looks like this. Now, this, strictly speaking, is not a crystalline um, uh, quartz. It's a cousin of it. It's a vertsite structure. But again, you can see sp3 hybridized yellow atoms with bridging 
uh, gray atoms. And when everything lines up, we end up with something that's a three-dimensional crystal. So you see something that is net cubic. You've got uh, t two atoms per lattice point and so on. There's a 001 plane, 002, and so on. Everything's making sense. And the same thing happens here. If, if this falls and forms on a line, then these three will line up as they do across this uh, 011 phase. But if the solidification occurs at a rate too rapid to allow everything to twist around, we end up with something that fails to achieve uh, crystallinity. So this is the origin. This is the origin of the uh, crystal structure that we see here. So again, just to recap, the silicon bonds, silicon bonds specified, they're fully specified. They're specified in in three directions, okay? Whereas the oxygen bonds are specified only in two dimensions, and therefore there's one degree of freedom. One degree of freedom. And this is where the cooling rate comes into play, because the cooling rate can quench in the motion before everything has twisted to rearrange itself. So, first thing to note. Second thing is we observe that this can continue without limit. There's no reason for this to terminate. So, we have long chains here. Long chains. So, this is in essence a polymer. This is in essence a polymer, and SiO2 is the Mer unit. You might say, well, gee, I see four oxygens bonded to the silicon, but each oxygen is shared by two silicons, so stoichiometrically it's SiO2. It all comes out in the wash. So you can think of this as long, long spaghetti. That's what we're looking at, molecules that are very long, and, they, and to make matters worse, they entangle in the liquid. So they crisscross each other, and now they have to disentangle and, and line up in such a way as to give us uh, something that is... Uh, crystalline. So what about evidence of disorder? Tom, may we go to the uh, computer graphic, please? So if we want to look for evidence of disorder, let's use some x-ray diffraction. And here you have two uh, um, specimens. The upper one is cristobalite, which is one of the several crystalline forms of SiO2. And here you see this is intensity versus some function of angle. And as you would expect, if something is crystalline, you would get distinct peaks. And those peaks come out of the selection rules, which you know on the basis of constructive and destructive interference. The lower trace is that of amorphous silica. Now note carefully, it's not a featureless spectrum. It has one feature. It has one feature. There's one broad peak. And why is there one broad peak as, as opposed to no peaks at all? Because there is in silica, there is short range order. I know what the local environment is around every silicon. It's four oxygens. We know the silicon oxygen bond distance, and we know that each of these is at 109 degrees from the central silicon, and that gives rise to this one broad peak. After that, where the second nearest neighbors lie depends on how those uh, backbones were twisted and turned at the time that motion ceased. So th the point here is, that in the glass we have no long range order, but we do have short range order, and the uh, X ray diffraction spectrum gives us that quite vividly. Um, so now let's look at the energetics of this. Let's look at energetics. Energetics of glass formation. First of all, which do we expect to be lower energy? The crystalline form or the glassy form? Which one would be lower energy? Well, how do you attack a problem like that? Well, ask yourself, what's the physical metric of energy in this system? It's bond formation. We know that bond formation lowers the energy of the system. That is to say, makes it more negative. So where do I form more bonds? When things are tightly packed in a crystalline array, or when they are loosely packed in this disordered glassy arrangement? Well, clearly the crystalline array gives us the most intimacy, and so therefore we would argue that the crystalline, crystalline solid is at lower energy. And it achieves lower energy by forming more bonds via higher bond density. 
Well, higher bond density would mean that for a given mass of material, if I have a higher bond density, it would be a more compact structure. More compact structure. More bonds per unit volume. So this leads to volume as a measure of disorder. Volume as a measure of disorder. As a measure of disorder. So I want to show you a trace that comes out of your your reading. This is from the uh, lecture notes, the archive lecture notes. And what we're looking at here is volume on the uh, ordinate as a function of temperature. And we're going to look at this in, in some details. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because this teaches us what's going on in these systems energetically using a macroscopic measure, the volume. It's trivial to measure volume. You can use Archimedean displacement. It's very easy to measure volume. All right, first of all, there's a, there's a typo in the book, excuse me, in the uh, archive notes. I think it's pretty clear that when temperature falls, it's cooling, so just uh, be mindful of that. So the first thing I want to do is get you referenced against the crystal, okay? So I'm going to use T colors today, all right? So let's start. We're going to go, since we're at MIT, we'll go on the red line, okay? So here's the red line. We start up here. We have a given amount of silicate glass and we decrease the temperature, that's what cooling means, we decrease the temperature, and if this is to form the crystal, in other words, I cool slowly enough that the atoms can rearrange, as is typical of crystalline solids, there's an abrupt change in volume at the freezing point. The liquid turns to solid and the system contracts in a discontinuous manner. The volume of the liquid is substantially less than that of a solid. Typically, there's a few exceptions, and we know what some of them are, such as ice, such as silicon, and a few other important uh, substances. But the, uh, the, the, the vast majority of substances pack more tightly in the solid state. So here we have the volume of solidification, and then as we continue to decrease the temperature, the volume decreases. Right? You know about thermal expansion, right? What's happening in thermal expansion? The atoms are moving about their rest positions. And so here we finally get to a temperature at which we have enough energy to break the lattice energy, and now we discontinuously jump up to the liquid state, and away we go. So this is the reference. And by the way, the, 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 notice one thing here, that the change in volume per unit change in temperature is much greater for a liquid than it is for a solid. And you can continue that. The unit change in volume per unit change in temperature is greater for a gas than it is for a liquid. I mean, this is the basis for thermometry, right? If you've got mercury in a glass bulb and the temperature changes, what you're betting is that the unit change in liquid volume, which is pretty much constrained in one dimension because we have a very tiny cross-sectional area, you're betting that the unit change in liquid volume is substantially higher than that of the unit change in the solid volume. In other words, the, if you'll forgive, forgive me the term, the glass thermometer that contains the mercury. It wouldn't do you any good if the mercury were expanding and the glass were expanding. That would be useless as a metric, wouldn't it? So what we're betting is that the unit change in volume of the liquid is substantially greater than that of the solid. And you can see that that would be the slope of this line. This would be dv by dt. And I've indicated this. This is the melting point. Melting point. Now, let's go down the green line. Now we're going to go down the green line. The green line starts up with the same liquid, but we're cooling at a much more rapid rate. We're cooling so quickly that all of the atoms can't twist and turn and find their crystalline positions. And so we just go zooming right through the melting point with no substantial decrease in volume. We continue to cool, cool, cool. Down here, we're acting as a liquid below the normal melting point. We have supercooled liquid. And finally, we get to a temperature below which the change in volume levels out to that of what you'd expect down here in the crystal. And this knee in the curve is called the glass transition temperature. So above the glass transition temperature, this material is behaving as a liquid. And you know that viscosity is strongly dependent upon temperature. So I'm not saying that this is flowing like water. It starts off flowing like honey, and down here it's, it's flowing like honey, you know, the proverbial molasses in January. It is viscous, but very, very viscous. But finally down here at this lower temperature interval, it's immobile. 
It's behaving as a solid. But the interesting thing here is that this knee in the curve is a function of the cooling rate. We have a rate-dependent process. As you'd expect, if I cool more quickly, it's like the musical chairs. Instead of gradually decreasing the volume, I just cut the volume. So let's do one more. So, by the way, what's the point of all this? I forgot. We said that volume is a measure of disorder. So if we use, let's say this down here against uh, um, the origin is room temperature. So the projection of this lower line would be the unit volume of the crystal. And you can see the projection of the upper line here is to a higher value. And that excess volume is some measure of how much disorder has been quenched in. If the crystal had truly formed, we would have the volume of the crystal. But let's do it again, only this time we go much more slowly when we cool. If we go more slowly, doesn't it stand to reason that the system will have more time to rearrange? And so therefore the amount of excess volume that quenches in is not as great. So this excess volume is not anywhere nearly as great. So what have we shown you? shown you a lot. We've shown you the dynamics of glass formation, so let's, let's write this all down. This is really good. So first of all, what do we see? We're, we're looking at liquid to solid transformation, and we have two possibilities. We can either make a crystal or we can make a glass. That is to say, it can be crystalline or amorphous. Okay, Crystalline or amorphous. And how do we indicate we indicate solidification point, solidification. The metric that we're using for solidification is the knee in the curve of volume versus temperature because we say we know we've achieved solidification on the basis of a coefficient of thermal expansion. Coefficient of thermal expansion of the solid is substantially less than the coefficient of thermal expansion of the liquid. So if we're looking at V versus T, we define, we define the temperature at which solidification has occurred when we switch from the high value of the liquid to the low value of the solid. And the only difference between solidification to form a crystal and solidification to form a glass is that if we look at V versus T for crystallization, I have a steep slope up here, I have a gentle slope down here, and I have an abrupt change. I have an abrupt change, whereas in the case of glass formation, V versus T, this is glass formation. In that case, I ha again, I have the steep slope at high temperature, I have the shallow slope at low temperature, but there is no abrupt change. So this is called the melting point, and this is called the glass transition temperature. Glass transition temperature. In both cases, it's the coefficient of thermal expansion that clues you in because in glass formation there's no abrupt change in volume and so this is going to be the lowest volume this is the volume of the crystal and these are this is the volume of glass at some particular cooling rate so this is V1 and just for reference V crystal is down here and this excess volume is the measure of disorder Excess volume is the measure of disorder. So, we're in good shape. Now we can make the definitions. Let's make the definitions. The one, let's compare the two forms of solidification. So the first one, crystallization. Crystallization. In both cases, we're going from liquid. In this case, we go from liquid to crystalline solid. Crystalline solid. And this occurs at a temperature called the melting point. And the melting point is not a function of cooling rate. As we're going to learn later, it's a function of certain environmental constraints, pressure, composition, but it's not a function of the cooling rate. It doesn't matter if I cool water, which doesn't form glass, if I cool water slowly or if I cool it rapidly at zero, excuse me, at one atmosphere pressure, 100% water should change from liquid to solid at zero degrees Celsius, always. Okay? So the melting point independent of cooling rate. Now contrast that with what we've observed here for glass formation. 
glass formation. This is, a, again, a form of solidification, but it's a different end result. Same composition. So in this case, we have supercooled liquid. It's liquid, but just to remind you, it's, it's liquid that's cooled below the melting point, T less than melting point, and it transforms to glassy, glassy solid or amorphous solid, and this occurs at a temperature known as the glass transition temperature, T sub G, and unlike the melting point, T sub G is a function of the cooling rate. It's a function of the cooling rate. So that's an engineering tool we can use. If we want to quench in more free volume, we cool at a higher rate. If we want less free volume, we cool at a lower rate. So this has to do with uh, the intersection between the theory and the processing. So that's what's going on in these, uh, in these uh, silicate glasses. And I don't want this to be so narrowly focused as only on silicates. There are other such systems. In other words, uh, inorganic covalent networks, so let's take a look at them. Other glass forming oxides, other glass forming oxides what are we going to look for? We're going to look for oxides that have the capability of forming covalent bonds, covalent bonds, covalent bonding of the metal atoms, of metal to metal, right? Silicon is more metallic than oxygen. So we have covalent bonding of metal to metal via bridging oxygen, via bridging oxygen. Oxygen acts as the bridge between the metal ions. So we never have two silicons bonding to one another. We always have a silicon to silicon via the oxygen. So let's look at them. Well, we've got silica. If we believe Mendeleev, then germania should work. GeO2 should work. So germinate glasses. We can also look at group 3, B2O3. Boric oxide can form glasses, borate glasses. And I think I've got a slide of that. Yeah, and the, on the left side, you see boron as group 3. It forms sp2 hybrids. So sp2 hybrids will give you three bonds, 120 degrees in the plane. So this is crystalline. This is crystalline B2O3 on the left side. Whereas on the right side, you see that sometimes there's the freedom to twist. And as a result, this is not lying in the plane. It's hard to see this. But the, the right-hand image um, rises and falls above and below the plane of the, of the uh, uh, projection. And the result is we have disorder. And you can see with the naked eye here. The unit volume, if we say in round numbers we have the same number of atoms left and right, you can see that the volume of the glass is far in excess in the volume of the crystal. And I could measure the change in volume between that of the disordered structure to that of the ordered structure and say the magnitude of that difference is a magnitude of glassiness. If this is only a small volume larger, it, it's axiomatic, then it must mean it's darn close to purely crystalline. So you can see very nicely. So this is borate glasses, and uh, we'll say something about those later. We can go to group 5, phosphate glasses, P2O5, vanadate glasses, uh, arsenate glasses, and lastly, stibnate glasses. So these are all elements that can form three-dimensional uh, covalent networks via bridging oxygens. Now, let's look at the properties. It's time to talk about properties. We know enough. Let's go. They're chemically inert. How did we conclude this? They're chemically inert. I've got strong covalent bonds, satisfied octet stability. These things are not going to react with other compounds because they're stable the way they are. Electrically insulating. How did I get that? Same thing. When you have strong bonds, whether it's strong ionic bonds, as in sodium chloride, or strong covalent bonds, as in SiO2 or diamond, strong bonds mean tightly held electrons. Now remember, all that glitters is not gold, but it must have free electrons. So this will not be a good conductor of electricity. In fact, it is a good insulator. And if you go out in the street and you see some of the old telephone poles, you'll see these 
uh, silicate, they're typically brownish, they're uh, standoffs where the wires uh, hang from cross member to cross member. They're all made out of these materials. Mechanically brittle, mechanically brittle, strong bonds. We don't have, we don't have the shared smearing of, of uh, orbitals as we do in metallic bonds. We don't have that. We have things that are very strong, very directional, and so there's no possibility of glide. Optically transparent. Yeah, I know, because they're glasses, right? No, they're optically transparent. Oxide glasses are optically transparent. Metallic glass is not optically transparent. Why are they optically transparent? Strong covalent bonds. So therefore, the energy levels are far apart, and visible light with its puny 2 to 3 electron volts per photon can't disturb the inner workings of the glasses. And they're visually arresting because they're because they they can form and they don't have to form sharp edges because they're amorphous so I showed you last day here's some more of these Chihuly glasses how do you get the color where's the color come from where do you get color how do we get the blue diamond well if the band gap is like this and photons of light are like this I need to park some dopant in the band gap this is band gap engineering Okay, so that's, those are the properties of, of, of the glasses. But there's one property I neglected to mention. With these strong bonds, what do you think their melting points are? High or low? They're high. And that's a problem because if I want to process these glasses, I have to go to really high temperatures. Now, for example, if, if, if you wanted to, to manufacture uh, beer, I mean, uh, soda bottles, and, you know, you... you, you you don't want to go up to 2,000 degrees centigrade to melt the glass. The energy costs are going to bury you. So, what could we do? If we were clever about the control of composition, maybe we could decrease the processing temperature. And indeed, that is the case. So, what I want to do is lower the processing temperature by weakening the bonds. Well, what are the bonds? They're strong covalent bonds. So, I'm going to weaken them. What I'm going to do is add an ionic oxide. So we want to lower, lower processing temperature, lower the processing temperature by weakening, by weakening bonds. And these are going to be the bonds along the backbone, silicon oxygen bonds. So the gambit is to add ionic oxides. Add ionic oxides. So let's look at one. Here's a Here's a classical one, calcium oxide. Calcium 2 plus, oxide 2 minus is a good. Calcium's from group 2, oxygen from group 16. We want an oxide because we want something that's soluble. So let's go. We're, let's dissolve calcium oxide into silica. So we dissolve, and calcium oxide is ionic, and it dissociates to give calcium cations and oxide anions. And then... The magic begins. Here's oxygen in a bridging position between two silicons. And here's this free oxide ion. So this is the ion. This is a bridging oxygen. A bridging oxygen. And what happens is this oxide ion comes over here and says, I can lower the energy of the system by breaking this bond and turning that structure into the following one. Instead, uh, oxygen will insert itself. And so now the chain has been cut here. The chain has been cut. This was a free oxygen. And now the oxygen's attached itself to one side of the broken piece of chain. And the other oxygen remains attached. And now I've got charge neutrality. I've got a two minus here. So I'll put one minus here and one minus here. So now the chain has been cut. And just for grins and chuckles, we'll bring over calcium as a spectator to give us charge neutrality. So what's the effect here? The effect here is to shorten the chain. Shorten the chain. And what happens if you shorten the chain? Well, look at our factors that promote glass formation. Viscosity, complexity, cooling rate. Which one of those is affected by shortening the chain? Viscosity. If you've got long spaghetti strands or short spaghetti strands, 
Okay? Spaghetti, macaroni, which one entangles? Which one's more difficult to move around? I know some of you haven't been in a kitchen in a, in a while, but imagine, just imagine. You can learn a lot. Studying pasta can teach you a lot about macromolecular behavior. All right? So clearly, these short chains now have higher mobility, lower viscosity. Well, if we have lower viscosity, if we have lower viscosity, then that's equivalent to moving over to the left here. That's going to decrease our glass transition temperature. So this will help us process. So this act is called chain scission. Chain scission. Chain scission. Gives us shorter chains, and the result is higher fluidity. Higher fluidity. And with higher fluidity, we don't have the propensity to form glass at the same temperature as we otherwise would, and so this gives us the ability to process at lower temperatures. So just to recap, the way to represent that reaction is to show this oxygen as a bridge. This is bridging oxygen plus ion, free ion, ionic oxygen, gives us two terminal oxygens. Terminal because each of these oxygens um, ends the chain segment that it's attached to. And it's got a little negative one charge associated with it. So this is chain scission, and this lowers, lowers TG, lowers TG. So that helps us to, to process. So what are the, what's the menu of oxides that we can use? I said we need something that's ionic, so it will donate the O double minus. If it doesn't donate O double minus, it won't help us uh, with this reaction. So there's a ton of oxides we can use. Group one, we could obviously use very uh, metallic oxides, lithium oxide, sodium oxide, potassium oxide, etc. We can pretty much use any group one oxide. I've shown you calcium oxide. If calcium oxide works, what's an even more strongly ionic oxide than calcium oxide of group two? Magnesium. Of course, it's smaller, got a higher charge density, higher metal-lung energy. Does that sound a little bit like quiz or test number two? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so we could use any of the group two oxides. They would work in chain scission. How about group three? Any oxide donor, good oxide donor. So, and we use these. I'm going to show you examples in commerce where these are used. Not the first one. Scandium oxide is not used. It's so, so expensive. But lanthanum oxide, maybe, but in your, in your uh, catalytic uh, converter, in the automobile, you have yttria-stabilized zirconia acting as the, um, as the sensor. And we can use some group four. Group four, we could use lead oxide. We'll see an example of that. Or you could use tin oxide. This is the divalent oxide, and this is the tetravalent oxide of tin. So these are all oxide donors, and we, you will see various combinations of these added to glasses in order to uh, achieve the kind of... Uh, the kind of um, chain scission that we're looking for. And here's some really interesting data. This is XPS data. This is XPS data. What we're looking at is uh, sodium oxide. This is Na2O, SiO2. So it's slightly modified. All right. These, these materials, all of them, I forgot, uh, I meant to give the uh, uh, term for all of these types of oxides, the ionic oxides that engage in chain scission, the term used for all of these uh, oxides is network modifiers, to modify the network by cutting the chain length. So these are called network, these are called network modifiers. So this is a slightly modified network that I, these data come from. And all of these are called network formers. Let's get that up there. These are all network formers. Network formers. We form the network, we modify the network, and tailor the properties. So this is sodium oxide silica, and what we're looking at is XPS of two, uh, of two different states. We're looking at the oxygen 1S. Oxygen 1S electron 
in this particular system. And the blue line is the raw data. The blue line is the raw data. So if you had that blue line, you'd say, gee, it doesn't look, it doesn't have the shape you would expect. It lacks symmetry. So what you can do is imagine that that blue curve is in fact the sum of two separate curves. And there's a mathematical technique called deconvolution that says if the blue curve were the sum of two properly configured curves, what would they look like? And so what you do is you deconvolve the blue curve into the red and the green curve. So if there were a red curve of this magnitude and a green curve of this magnitude with the right symmetry, they would sum to give us the blue curve. And furthermore, we see that there's two curves that uh, have been ascribed to bonding oxygen, or what we call bridging oxygen, and the, what I'm calling terminal oxygen for the red, or they're calling non-bridging oxygen. So you can actually tell the difference in the energy states of those two oxygens, because what you're looking at is this is the bridging oxygen, and this is non-bridging oxygen. And we're looking at not the, the valence electrons, we're looking at the inner shell electrons, the 1s. And so the presence of the silicon on either side, the presence on the silicon here on either side, as compared to the presence of silicon only on one side, has an effect on what the 1s electron in the two atoms senses in terms of nuclear charge versus screening of all the electronic charge. Clearly in this case with the silicon, the silicon pulls the electrons farther out than they would be here because here you've got non-bonding electrons not, have, not having to go out. So in this XPS spectrum it's possible to see the subtle difference in the energetics of the two uh, electronic states, which I think is just so so cool. It's very elegant. It's very elegant. And so let's, let's keep going. What's the worst we can do to modify the network? I said this is a long chain. I keep cutting and cutting and cutting until in the extreme I'm down to one unit. I can't get any smaller than one unit. So what's one unit? It's silicon with four oxygens. One, two, three, four. Silicon's plus four. Each of the oxygens is minus two. So this has a net charge of four minus. So it's just a single complex anion, right? It's just something with a net charge of minus uh, four, and this is called the orthosilicate, orthosilicate anion. And we could make a compound of this stuff. If we took, we need to balance it with some cation. We can't just throw anions around. So if you had Ca, calcium, you could take two times calcium, one times orthosilicate. This would be a, a salt. This would be analogous to sodium chloride or calcium fluoride. Only here you've got silicate as your anion and calciums. This stuff here does not form glass. This behaves as a molten salt. So it's very uh, uh, poor as, at glass forming and will crystallize on, uh, on uh, cooling. Well, let's look at the compositions of some of these glasses. Now that we know we've got, we can engineer properties by playing with a mix of former and modifier. There's a few of them worth looking at. First one is window glass, soda lime. Well, it's soda lime because it contains soda, which is sodium oxide, and lime, which is calcium oxide. What are they doing? They are cutting the chains, making the chains shorter so that you don't have to heat window glass to 2,000 degrees centigrade to process it. You can process this stuff down around six, 700 degrees C. Uh, let's see, what, what else do we have here? Uh, borosilicate. This is the workhorse for uh, Pyrex. You have two network formers. You have silica and B2O3 with a little bit of modifier, sodium oxide and alumina. Alumina is added to give thermal shock resistance. And thermal shock resistance comes from a third category called an intermediate. And an intermediate, intermediate improves, improves thermal and mechanical behavior by adding void space by adding void and it does this because it forms these are covalent I'm going to show you these are covalent they're covalent um, 
compounds, but with a different coordination number. In fact, the coordination number is higher. The coordination number is greater than the coordination number of the host, of the host network. So, for example, uh, you see up here alumina. The typical ones are alumina, titania, or zirconia. And these typically have coordination numbers on the order of 6 to 8, whereas silica has a coordination number of 4. So by having the higher coordination number, when you have rapid thermal uh, change, the system doesn't shock and, and shatter. Instead, there's, there's room for flexure. This allows for some flexure. Because remember, plastic deformation is out of, the, out of, the, out of consideration here. There's no opportunity for such things. So you can see uh, evidence of that. Here's some uh, uh, light flint optical glass. 37% lead oxide. So what's the lead oxide doing? Two things, two things. First of all, lead oxide up here is a modifier. So it's breaking the um, chains. And secondly, lead is one of the heaviest naturally occurring elements. So it's got a lot of electrons. So lead oxide is going to have a very, very high index of refraction. And in fact, if you put more than 24 weight percent lead oxide into silica, you have enough chain scission that when you cut that glass, it will look as though it is crystalline. And that's the basis for lead crystal. It's lead oxide modified silicate glass. And here they want to use it for high index of refraction optics so that you don't have to wear uh, eyeglasses the shape of Coke bottles. You can now have something that's very, very thin. And now they've been able to do this in polymers to allow you to get the... Uh, performance that you need. So now here we look at, this is uh, the other curve from the reading. It shows viscosity as a function of temperature. And as I mentioned earlier, very strong temperature dependence. But what you can see is, here's pure silica, SiO2. And if you're going to work with the glass, you have to get the viscosity down to about 10 to the uh, fifth uh, poise. Just for reference, uh, water is 10 to the minus 2 poise. It's uh, one centipoise. So this stuff is very, very viscous. Right? And th th it becomes more and more viscous uh, going through the softening point and finally annealing and strain. And on the next, uh, next uh, uh, slide are these definitions, and, and they're uh, posted at the website so you can go through. They're also in the readings. And all they're doing is defining the, th these different points in terms of the change in viscosity. In other words, it's a measure of how quickly the atoms can rearrange as a function of, of temperature that defines these different breakpoints. And these are not exact. In other words, it, it's not as though the working point is 10 to the fifth poise. If it's 2 times 10 to the fifth, you can't work with it. It just becomes more and more difficult to work with it. So if you see people downstairs in the basement of Building 4 in the glass shop, when they're taking something out of the lair, the furnace, when they take the glass out and it's glowing red heat, then it's up here uh, in the re regime of working point. And as the glass radiates and the temperature is falling, they have a certain time window during which they can form the glass. And if the temperature gets below the softening point, at that point, they are not going to be able to shape the glass. So this is what you're seeing on this slide. And you can see how the addition of uh, various elements, if you take a constant value, let's say take the working the working temperature, which is in round numbers 10 to the fifth poise. So for pure silica, we'd have to be up here at around 2,000 degrees Celsius. But if we add uh, B2O3 and some uh, Na2O, now we're operating at around 1,000 degrees. And if you add some uh, calcium oxide lime, now you're able to operate down around 800 degrees. So you can see how by changing composition through this mechanism, you can dramatically alter the processing temperatures of the of the various glasses. And that's, that's exactly what we're doing. So last thing, last thing to talk about is uh, strengthening of glass, how to strengthen glass. Glass is not too bad in compression, but it's very weak in tension. Strengthening of glass. So two ways of doing it. First is to thermally treat the glass. 
we're going to exploit the fact that glass has this dependence of uh, quenched in volume on temperature. So let's go back to this. What we do is, in this case, imagine we're uh, going to treat the windshield of an automobile. So we want to make it more resistant to cracking if a stone should hit it. So this is not to scale, of course. This is glass that's being processed. It's, it's, it's in, it's above its, uh, its softening point. Rather than just let it cool and cool very slowly, what we can do is send an air jet, air jet along the surface. And what that will do, what the air jet will do is cause the surface to cool more rapidly than the center. We know that glass is a poor conductor of heat, so we're not going to expect that this is going to be isothermal. So I have, I'm going to break this in half, and then I'm going to take this part and expand it. Okay? And I'm going to divide the top into two zones. So this is fast cooling, fast cooling, and the center is slow cooling, and likewise on the bottom side. So what happens? If you look on this uh, trace, it says fast cooling gives me high excess volume. So I could say that when this is finished, I could characterize it as follows. That because the upper portion cooled quickly, it should occupy a large volume. And the lower portion cooled slowly, it wants to occupy a smaller volume, but they're joined. So what does that require? It requires it all be one volume. So that means the lower part is going to force the upper part in. So when the thing, in fact, looks like this, we know that the upper part is on the influence of strong compressive stresses. And as a result, if a stone hits this, instead of simply having to break the bonds, it has to overcome all of the bonds plus the added stress that has been the material is pre-stressed. So now in order to break this, I have to break both the bonds bonds plus pre-stress. And again, if you study this V versus T curve, you can convince yourself that high cooling on the outer edge will give you a higher volume, but the material is not allowed to delaminate, so in fact, the surface has a compressive stress that is built in. Okay. Well, there are other ways to strengthen it. Let's see, here's one. There's a, the ability to uh, recrystallize glasses recrystallize glasses. In this case, what uh, is done is to introduce crystalline material into the glass during the cooling process. So now we're going to combine the properties of crystals with glasses. And this was work that began back in the 50s at Corning under Stuckey. And what they did was they add nucleating agents to the glass melt. And these nucleating agents do not dissolve. They're floating around like grains of sand in honey. And they cause the honey to crystallize out. And the result is that when this thing grows to completion, what we have is a material that is, these are the various grains. During solidification, these start to solidify, nucleate crystalline glass. When these grow to impingement, we have something that is, in many instances, 95% crystalline. And the only glass is this mortar in between, 5% glassy. And these are the glass ceramics, which uh, you, if you go to your uh, grandma's house, you'll see this stuff here. Remember these? This is pyroceram glass. It's 95% crystalline, 95% crystalline. The, uh, the grain size is about one micron, which is large enough to scatter light, and that's why it's white, because this is all high band gap material. It should all be transparent and visible light. But this is white the same, for the same reason that table salt is white. A large single crystal of sodium chloride is transparent. But if you crush it up in a fine powder, it appears white because of the scattering. That's what you see here. And this was designed by Corning, which, by the way, doesn't make Corning wear anymore. Uh, they moved into optoelectronics and so on, fiber optics. So anyways, if you see this on eBay, you know that this is pyroceram. It has amazing toughness. I used to have a demonstration. I had one of these, uh, a saucepan, and I'd hold up a 2x4 and drive a roofing nail into the 2x4 using the pyroceram saucepan as the hammer. These things have enormous strength, and they're also transparent in the microwave region. They're great in the thing, and I'm not trying to you know, do a cooking show here. I'm just telling you that these are engineered materials. 
All right, now next one is visions. This is visions. Maybe you see some of that around. The only difference between visions is that the crystallites are submicron size. And so now they remain transparent to visible light. And they index match them so that the index of refraction of the glassy mortar is the same as the index of refraction of the crystalline material. And then they dope with transition metal so that it looks sort of like the old copper, elegant, chi-chi upscale cookware. And uh, also you can charge a premium over plain, uh, clear, colorless Pyrex. And so all of this is d done by engineering of the molecular architecture. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>